Welcome back, everyone. Today we are talking about design envelopes, which is the process of finding the worst case demands along the length of a structure. Now, this will apply influence lines. So if you haven't checked out the two previous videos on influence lines, go do that right now. Come right back here and we'll do some design envelopes. To introduce this concept of design envelopes, let's take a simple structure here where I have a 20 foot span for my main span and a five foot cantilever. And let's say, for example, that I'm interested in my maximum demands at this point right here. So if I'm going to do that, I need to place my loads on the structure. And for this case, I'm going to consider dead load and live load in combination. So my dead load will be 1.5 kips per foot as a distributed load. My live load will be two separate loads, a two kip per foot distributed load, plus a three kip point load located somewhere on the structure. And I'm going to combine these using the factors of 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live. Now, if I place my dead load, I know it has to be applied everywhere. So we'll put the dead load on the structure and that's just due to self weight. So I don't really get a choice with that. It's always going to be along the entire length of the structure. Now for live load, I can choose to position it because a distributed live load, we can pattern it and a point load, we can move it around the structure. So for example, I could have live load on this span over here, but then not on the adjacent cantilever or vice versa, or perhaps I could even just load half of my span. And my point load could be located anywhere along the structure. And I would like to know where that will cause the worst case design scenarios. So let's start off with a discussion of shear, and then we'll continue this with a discussion of moment. So if I'm looking at the shear at our point of interest right here, I can draw an influence line for shear. So that influence line will look like this, just using the Mueller-Breslau principle. And I know if, for example, this distance here is 10 foot, so that I'm looking exactly at mid-span, that this negative peak is negative 0.5, at the positive value is 0.5, and then out here on the end, it's going to be a negative 0.25. So doing that, I can see that I really have two regions where I can apply load. So I can either apply load in the positive shear region, or I can apply load in the negative shear region, which happens to be split up into two separate areas here. So let's say I'm going to design for positive shear here. I would choose to apply my live load in the worst case location, which would be right here where I have positive shear influence. And then I'll place my point load where I have the largest point of my influence line, which would be at this 0.5 location right here. Similarly, if I'm going to look at the worst case lower bound shear, I'm still going to have dead load applied everywhere. And again, we don't really have a choice with dead load, but for my live load, I'm going to assume that it is split up over two regions like this. That's going to give me only negative shear and no positive shear which would be the worst case for a lower bound shear. And I'll place my load just to the left there where it's landing on this negative 0.5. So that's going to be the worst case shear for the negative point load here. So now let's go ahead and calculate that worst case positive and negative shear at my location of interest. To find the effects of a distributed load using the influence line, we're going to multiply that distributed load by the area under our influence line. And likewise, if we want to find the effects of a point load, we'll take that load and multiply it by the value of the influence line wherever that happens to be applied. So let's start off with our upper bound shear V plus here. And I'll start with my dead load, which is with a factor of 1.2 and 1.5 kips per foot. I then need to multiply it by the area where that load is applied. Now that load is applied over the total area. So I need to find the total area under my influence line. So if I calculate that, I see I have three triangles here. This triangle has an area of negative 2.5. This triangle has an area of positive 2.5. And our final triangle has an area of negative 0 0.625. So calculating up the two total area, it's negative 2.5 plus 2.5 minus 0 0.625. Next, I'll move on to the live load. We'll start with the distributed live load. It has a factor of 1.6 and a magnitude of two kips per foot. And it's applied only where I have this positive area. And again, that's to ensure that I have the maximum possible shear there. So it's going to be multiplied by 2.5. And then if I consider the point load, it's still gonna have a factor of 
the magnitude is 3 kips, and the peak at which it's located is 0.5. So adding all these things together, I find my positive shear is 9.275 kips. Now we'll repeat this process for the negative shear. So V minus, the dead load term is identical. So we have the same load, we have the same area. So nothing changes with that. And it's always applied, so I don't really get any options with that. But now if I apply my live load, 1.6 times 2.0 kips per foot, now I have to consider it applied over my negative area of negative 2.5 and negative 0.625. So minus 2.5, minus 0 0.625. And then finally, I will have my point load that's plus 1.6 times the point load mag magnitude of three kips, multiplied by negative 0.5, which is the value of my influence line where that load is applied. So summing that all together, we'll find that this is negative 13.525 kips. So from this result, we know that shear at that midspan location has to be somewhere between negative 13.525 kips and positive 9.275 kips, regardless of where I place that load. So these we consider the envelope of my shear demands at that particular location. So let's repeat the same process for the moment. So again, I'll look at moment at here at midspan, which is 10 foot in. And if I draw that influence line, we'll know it looks something like this. We'll find that this peak up here is five and our negative value here is negative 2.5. And knowing that I'm going to need the areas, let's find those right now. The area of this full triangle here in the positive region is going to be 50. And this area in the negative region is negative 6.25. So once again, let's place our load for the positive moment case and for the negative moment case. For the positive moment case, I have dead load everywhere. And then I'm going to have live load only where I have positive influence line. So I'm only gonna place live load in my first span and not on the cantilever. And then I'll place my point load at the point of maximum influence, which is the peak right here at five. And then for the negative moment case, I'm going to place the dead load everywhere once again, but the live load is only placed on the cantilever span, and my point load will be out here at the end where I have the worst case negative influence. So calculating that moment at that location, M plus is going to be my load, which is 1.2 times 1.5 hips per foot, and the total area is 50 minus 6.25. And then for my live load, 1.6 times the load of 2.0 kips per foot. And the positive area where that live load is applied is 50. And then my point load plus 1.6 times the load magnitude of three kips multiplied by the peak influence where that load, load is located. And that would be multiplied by five. So calculating that all out, we have a moment of 262.75 kip feet. Similarly, for my negative moment, we'll have M minus. Dead load is the same, so we can't do anything to change the dead load. So it's 1.2 times 1.5 kips per foot, and the area is still 50 minus 6.25. Now moving on to the live load, I have plus 1.6 times the live load magnitude of two kips per foot, times the area of negative 6.25. And then my point load is 0.1.6 multiplied by the load magnitude of three kips, and then the negative influence is negative 2.5 where that load is located. So calculating that all out, this is 46.75 kip feet. Now it turns out that moment is still positive, that can happen. Again, the reason that's occurring is because my dead load is always applied and that's sort of building up a very large positive moment at that region, which cannot be overcome by my live loads that are placed in the cantilever. So in this case, my moment will vary somewhere between 46.75 and 262.75 kip feet, but there's no possibility of an actual negative moment in this region. So that's all well and good. I found my shear and moment envelopes for a specific point on my structure. But let's say I want to generalize this for my entire structure. So I want to have the envelope as a function of x along the entire length here from 0 to 25. So let's take a look at that. 
We'll first start by looking at the shear. And if we think back to Mueller-Bress law, we can really only have two different shapes for our shear diagram in this case. One, if I'm looking at X from zero to 20 in this span, and I'll have a different looking influence line if I'm looking at my cantilever span. So let's say, for example, I sketch something in this first span right here. We know that the influence line is always going to look something like this. And if I take a different location of interest, it's still gonna have the same kind of shape here. And it doesn't actually matter where I look, it's always gonna look like this curve. So let's just say that this distance here is X, and therefore this distance is 20 minus X, and then our cantilever length is of course still five. Now, if we do that, we can find the height of this point, this point, and this point, knowing that we have two similar triangles here, one with a base of X, and one with a base of 20 minus X. So if we calculate some similar triangles, we'll find that this has a negative X over 20, and this value up here is 20 minus X over 20. And because we know that this angle and this angle are equivalent, I can also find this value right down here, and it's always negative 0.25, regardless of the value of X. Now, because I know I'm gonna to have to find some areas, let's go ahead and compute those. This triangle is going to be a negative one half times base, which is X, times the height, which is X over 20. And this triangle here is going to be one half times the base, which is 20 minus X, times the height, which is 20 minus X over 20. And finally, I have one last triangle, which is negative one half, base is five, and height is 0 0.25. Now, if I move on to my cantilever region, that influence line there is not going to look anything like what I've just drawn. And in fact, it's just going to be a straight line, and then it's going to suddenly jump up by one, but it's still going to remain at a slope of zero. So here's our height of one. And if I calculate that area, knowing that this distance here is X, so therefore this distance here is 25 minus X, then I know that the area that I've just blocked off right here is going to be 25 minus X. So now I've generalized my influence line so that I'm looking at any position X along the length of the structure. And even when X crosses my boundary here, where suddenly my influence line shape changes, I can still consider that case. Now we can continue and do the same process that we did with the previous example, knowing that I can find my areas, which are just functions of X. I can find my peaks, which are also just functions of X. In this particular case, you'll have to compare two different peaks for the negative shear because there's a possibility that my load could be out here controlling or it could be out here. So you'll have to check both of those. And then for the cantilever span, I'll, I'll notice that there's actually no possibility of a negative shear there. The peak is always gonna be right here at the end and I'm only gonna be considering a positive area. So this process, we can automate it just with a spreadsheet and we can find the shear envelope. So here's our shear envelope. We can see that we have maximum shear just as we would expect at the supports. At the very end there, it does look like there's some shear, but that is because you could have a point load at the very end right here. So even though this area goes to zero, you could have some shear due to the point load at the very end. Now we'll notice a very interesting property about this shear envelope, and that is that it is a concave shape. So being concave, I really don't need to find this as a function of X along the whole length. Rather, I can just choose some judicious points and connect them with straight lines. So for example, if I calculate my worst case shear at the end at mid span, which we had already done, and then on either side of the support, and then at my final end right here, and I just connect those with straight lines, we find that we have a very serviceable approximation of my shear envelope. And so in practice, this is often what's done. We wouldn't actually need to go through a whole function of X, though it is possible to do so if you'd like to. So last thing that we'll do is we'll move on to our moment envelope. Now for my moment, I'm going to look at my main span here. And if I look anywhere in that main span, I'm going to have an influence line that looks something like this. And it doesn't really matter where you take that. It's always gonna have this similar kind of shape. Now the location of that peak is going to be location X. That's where I'm examining my moment. So therefore this distance here is 20 minus X and my cantilever is still a distance of five away. And if I evaluate the triangles, I know that 
that I have two triangles that have to come to the same height right here at my peak. And the slope change at this location is going to be a change of one. Now we can go through and solve that, but there is a little shortcut that you can do to find your various slopes. And that's to know that this slope here is going to be equal to 20 minus X, which is the length of your opposite triangle divided by the total length of those two triangles, which is 20. That's being the distance from here to here. And then the slope over here is going to be X over 20, X being the opposite length divided by the total length here. And of course, if you add those two together, you will get one. So knowing those slopes, therefore, I can find my peak right at this location. So that peak is going to be 20 minus X over 20 multiplied by X. So that's following the slope of 20 minus X over 20 over distance X. And we can follow the slope of X over 20 to get my peak at the end of the cantilever. And we'll find that's negative X over four. Now I know I'm going to need the area, so the area of this total positive triangle here, so that would be the entire area from zero to 20 here, is going to be one half times the base, which is 20, times the height, which is 20 minus X over 20, multiplied by X. And finally, we can get the area of this triangle over here, which is one half times base, which is five, times the height, which is negative X over four. Now, if I look at the cantilever, we're going to have a straight line from zero up until X, my location of interest. And then suddenly my slope is going to change by one. So it's going to go down one by there. This total distance here is X. And therefore, this distance will be 25 minus X. And thus, I can find this value is negative 25 minus X. Lastly, I'm going to need to know this area right here. It's a negative area of negative one half times the base, which is 25 minus X times the height, which is also 25 minus X. So if we follow that same process that we did before, but now our areas are functions of X, we can plot a moment envelope for all locations X. And here it is. So We'll notice that if we look at mid span right here, these were the values that I had seen previously and we're always gonna have a positive moment there and we can't really avoid that. However, this shape is not always concave. We actually have a convex shape. So if I calculate only my moment at the end, which is obviously going to be zero, and I connect that with a line from zero to 20, I see that I'm going to underestimate my actual moment demands by some value. So this would be an unconservative assumption to just look at specific locations, for example, mid span and this point right here, if I really wanted to know my moment demand at this location. Perhaps for my design, I don't need to know that. Perhaps I'm going to design it just for this peak moment and I'm just going to ignore anything else. But still, it's a good practice to know that this is not going to be a concave shape. It is going to be convex. The other benefit of looking at this as a function of X is I know exactly where I can have a negative moment. So if I'm doing, for example, reinforced concrete design and I'm laying out top steel to carry that negative moment, I know that my negative moment is only going to reach out to this 15 feet mark. And this region from zero to 15 has no possibility of a negative moment under my design loads. And so that wraps up our discussion of moment envelopes. Again, this moment envelope is a very useful design tool. It tells me the range over which my design moments must lie for my given loading scenario. So I know my moment can never be above this point nor below this location right here. And I know my moment variations along the whole length X. So as always, I hope you learned something. Please subscribe and I will see you next time.